All right, great. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the first seminar of the 2012-13 Mighty Energy Initiative Seminar Series. This is the fifth year uh, of its existence. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsor, um, which is IH, IHS CIRA, uh, who's also an affiliate of, My of Mighty. Now, typically the seminar starts at 4.15. This is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, for flight reasons, so uh, just going forward, the seminar will be held uh, in the second Tuesday of each month at 4.15 in this, in this room. Um, all right, so I'm very excited to have Mike Gallagher here today to talk about natural gas and transportation. Mike is also the best example I can think of uh, t for, for somebody to never retire. Um, basically, he retired recently. He was the chief uh, operating Officer of, of Westport Innovations, and it seems since he's retired, he's, he's working harder than he ever did uh, before retirement. Um, currently, he's the chairman of a 60 organization natural gas group for the two-year study um, sponsored by the DOE and, and ran through the, the National Petroleum Council. Uh, he's also the chairman of, board, of, of the board of Agility Fuel Systems. Um, Chairman of the Squawk Mud Natural Gas Vehicle Partnership and former chairman of the board of, of Cummins Westport. Uh, he also gets to do some fun things as it appears he's also on the board of trustees for the Vancouver Opera Foundation. Uh, so I don't think he's talking about opera today, but he's no. going to talk about natural <laughs> gas as a, as a transportation fuel. Thank so you, take Chris. Away, Mike. Uh, thank you very much and thank you all for uh, coming out. Uh, to listen and uh, chat uh, with me today. Um, I, 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 not on my short bio, but it's uh, also of note that I was I, I spent some time at M MIT. It's been a while, but I was a visiting professor here uh, in 1979, 1980, uh, 32 years ago when I moved back to San Francisco at that time. Uh, and had, had some fun for 15 months or so as a technical director on a big energy project uh, at that time as well. It was a, uh, an international 16-nation uh, look at oil, energy, and coal prospects. The, the uh, emphasis was on the role of coal to help with uh, global energy problems and ended up uh, publishing a couple of books. Uh, one of which I remember my, uh, my young kids were excited to see in the, the window of the Harvard Coop uh, for a week or so. It's called Coal uh, Bridge to the Future. So uh, I'm now, uh, for the past decade, I've been at uh, Westport Innovations in Vancouver, Canada, working on natural gas, which, uh, which I think of as the, kind of the, the new bridge to the future, you know, if you think about things. Uh, and so I've been very happy to kind of see this, uh, this business of natural gas as a transportation fuel develop really from its infancy uh, over the last decade or so and now uh, have the chance, as Chris mentioned, to uh, chair the natural gas working group of this uh, massive uh, uh, National Petroleum Council study that we've just finished. Um, I, I did retire as president of uh, Westport uh, two and a half years ago now and as Chris said, have been uh, pretty unsuccessful in uh, retiring so far. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping that next year might be a little, little lighter, as is my wife. Um, we've been in Vancouver t uh, for 10 years. Uh, Westport's headquartered there. I won't say, I'm not really going to talk about Westport in today's talk other than just give you the 30 second summary, which is a company formed, it's a tech company. It's formed uh, 16 years ago in Vancouver, spin off from the university, spin off from UBC. Uh, aimed at developing uh, natural gas engines, uh, uh, figured out how to run natural gas into diesel engines with the same efficiency, power, and torque, and built a business around it. It's still, uh, still a, you know, a smallish company, but uh, uh, we've grown from about uh, value, a market value of $30 million when I joined Westport uh, 10 years ago to, to uh, close to $2 billion today in market cap. So it's a, it's a success story. It's a, it's um, widely uh, reported, uh, particularly in Canada, but is generally viewed as the company in the world that understands uh, natural gas engines, natural gas as a transportation fuel. And that's why I got asked uh, uh, by the leadership of this NPC study to take on this uh, natural gas group. I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, to some degree what I see is the future of natural gas as a transportation fuel today. 
uh, but I'm going to focus on the findings of this study, which is uh, just launched uh, August the 1st in Washington, D.C., uh, and I'm going to share with you how we put together uh, the, the look at uh, the U.S. transportation system, the alternate uh, fuels and technologies, um, the role of natural gas, and how, how all this was integrated, and some of the findings that came out about that, or from that, that uh, articulate possible futures for natural gas as a transportation fuel. We looked at uh, the spectrum from uh, heavy duty uh, trucks and buses uh, to light duty uh, uh, vehicles, passenger cars in the analysis. Um, so let me just jump in and see, uh, see what we've got. Uh, I like to remind people that when we look at transportation and oil, uh, you know, the issues are pretty specific. Uh, on the right side, uh, you know, I show that petroleum in the U.S. and pretty much anywhere in the world, if you include biofuel blends as well, runs just about every vehicle in the world. 99% or so of all transportation fuel is petroleum, uh, either uh, by itself or mixed with uh, biofuels. Everything else, whether it's natural gas or electric vehicles or fuel cells, uh, is 1% or less of what, what we're using for transportation. So when we talk about the future of anything besides petroleum, uh, as a fuel for transportation. We're talking about things that are just brand new, starting from scratch, basically. We're trying to create a new technology uh, for vehicles and a new industry around it uh, so that can contribute. Other sectors, totally different story. U.S. Power, for example, the light blue uh, slice at the top 1% is, is petroleum's uh, role in the U.S. power sector. Only 1% of, of U.S. power is met by petroleum. All but 1% is, is uh, petroleum in transportation. Power has a, you know, our power sector uh, has a variety of fuels that can be used, uh, a variety of technologies. Transportation is so tough because it's all petroleum. It's, it's either gasoline or diesel fuel. Um, uh, spark ignited or, or diesel engines, but there just haven't been many alternatives for running vehicles available to people. So the purpose of this uh, study, uh, which was commissioned by the Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, uh, was to take a look 40 years into the future and assess um, what the various uh, alternative technologies might be able to do uh, in terms of contributing to the U.S. energy transportation mix. Uh, so he's asked us to look at the whole transportation sector, to look at the main alt fuels that are available, uh, to look at all kinds of factors around uh, deploying these systems from uh, technology to economics to cost uh, to engine availability uh, to environmental uh, attributes, uh, greenhouse gases and others, etc. And, and he asked us to focus uh, particularly hard on um, you know, a high visibility topic, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, specifically to assess whether it were possible, and if so, how, to achieve a 50% reduction from today's emissions level uh, in greenhouse gases emitted from the transportation sector by 2050. And so you'll see in some of the, some of the slides I show you um, what we came up with there. Uh, how that looks, how some of the different technologies play into it. Uh, so, so today we've got uh, you know an hour or so. I'm kind of going to run through uh, somewhat briefly the, the the makeup of that study, so you can get a sense on uh, who was involved and uh, what was the approach. Uh, then I'm going to spend some time talking about the major findings of the study, whether they be natural gas or other fuels. And then I'm going to uh, drill down into the natural gas findings and look uh, first at uh, natural gas for heavy duty transportation, trucks and buses. Uh, and I'm going to look at that first because that's the area where we're seeing a fair amount of uh, progress uh, today already in North America. And then I'm going to look at the uh, the possible implications for light duty uh, vehicles where there are a lot of alternatives that are being looked at. Uh, so that, that's kind of the structure of what I hope to, to do today. There's still a few seats uh, up in the front half of anybody's uh, struggling to find a chair front half of the room here. Uh, the analysis on this thing um, started out by bringing a lot of experts into play, like myself in the case of natural gas, but with a view to looking at, uh, in addition to conventional hydrocarbon liquids, four specific 
uh, types of alt fuels and technologies. So, so we got biofuels, uh, electric vehicles, and then on the right side, natural gas and hydrogen. In the case of hydrogen, uh, we were looking specifically at hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, so each of us was asked to form uh, working groups uh, around those uh, areas of interest and to essentially, uh, we, the study called it step one, pretty basic uh, language here, but step one involved me organizing a whole bunch of people to study uh, what natural gas technology could do for transportation and lay out all the challenges we could identify in expanding that uh, industry, including uh, uh, cost and environmental issues, economics, uh, infrastructure challenges, etc. And then the same thing was done for every one of these areas. Uh, there's a study leadership that p was put together. Uh, the chair was the uh, chairman of Marathon, Clarence Caslot. NPC, uh, by the way, National Petroleum Council, is a Washington, D.C. based, a sm pretty small staff that was set up years ago for the sole purpose of advising the, uh, the Secretary of Energy on issues that he deemed important. So every year or two, he commissions a study uh, on something that's on his mind, and this was the one he commissioned. Uh, in early 2010, late uh, 2009. Uh, MIT had some pretty interesting involvement in this thing because you had John Deutsch as chair of the uh, technology arm of the study. You see John's name up under technology vice chair. Um, and, and then we had a subcommittee put together for the whole stu uh, study uh, showing the people here, including representatives from the Department of Energy, uh, some of the oil companies, uh, myself uh, and others. Um, so we functioned as a coordinating committee for the whole study and then a bunch of us had separate roles in our own area of expertise, in my case uh, natural gas. Um, I got the call, I, I retired from uh, my presidency at Westport in March, uh, January of 2010 and I was well on my way to a fairly uh, life of leisure sort of semi-retirement until this phone call in June of that, that year from uh, Linda Capuano, whose name is up there, Marathon, chair of the coordinating subcommittee. And I didn't know anything about the study. Uh, I knew what NPC was, but uh, she just asked if I would uh, get involved on behalf of Westport, and I said, sure. Didn't sound like a big deal at the time. Uh, and about two weeks later, she called back and said, how'd, how'd you like to actually chair the natural gas? Uh, section of this thing and I said sure okay didn't sound like a big deal I mean natural gas for transportation is pretty new uh, how hard can this be but then it became clear that she actually wanted to organize a pretty extensive team and look at this thing from the ground up in a, in a very serious way so so it's ended up taking close to half of my time my personal time for the last two years now to get to where we are today um, we broke the leadership down into uh, s uh, a bunch of subgroups. So you'll see me under natural gas, uh, Mike Gallagher, Westport, uh, biofuels uh, led by Archer Daniels, uh, Toyota uh, led the work on electric vehicles. So each of these line items represented a, a working group that had to be formed with a specific mission in mind. Um, the integrated vehicles, which I'll talk more about later, General Motors, Clay Phillips, was one of the more interesting ones because the challenge of this group was to take all this uh, information that was coming in from advocates of a technology like myself, in the case of natural gas, the hydrogen fuel cell guys, but put it all together in some sort of analytical framework where you could compare and contrast the different alternatives, think about the economic attractiveness, think about the, the, the GHG impacts, et cetera. So this integrating function turned out to be a huge uh, exercise with uh, lots of uh, energy modeling work and things like that that I'll, I'll say a few words about. Uh, the study ended up uh, uh, having over 300 participants from all these organizations, including the ones, the people re recruited by each of us who were chairing these uh, subgroups. And on the left, you can see the, the kinds of organizations they came from, uh, about a quarter from the oil and gas industry and another quarter from uh, transport manufacturers, uh, which are people like myself and General Motors and Toyota and the truck guys. And on the right side, uh, 
Uh, but you can see we had some academia, 7%, uh, uh, NGOs, 9%, uh, etc. So it was a pretty broad-based set of folks uh, from a very broad-based set of companies as well. U.S. focus, so almost everyone from U.S. or Canada, most, mostly from the United States. And then in terms of the skills makeup, uh, you know, it was, it was very much a technical group of peop people. Seventy percent of the participants were, uh, had technical backgrounds of one kind or another, and the other uh, 30 percent or so um, actually, this it were uh, from the fields of policy, government policy, energy policy, or uh, uh, economics prim primarily. But, but we like to say that this was a technical study um, conducted for the most part by technologists with some smattering of policy and economic uh, uh, talent. Uh, in the case of the natural gas team, th this is the group of companies I recruited to join me, companies and organizations, to join me on the analysis of this natural gas uh, uh, situation. Not so much the fuel, but what it would take to deploy natural gas in, in vehicles in the United States. Some 60 organizations I recruited, uh, including uh, Dan Cohn from MIT, who's uh, sitting here somewhere, I think. Uh, there he is. Thank you, Dan. Um, but uh, this, this was unusual for um, me and for my company, Westport, to be uh, sitting at a table with this mix of people talking about these issues. Uh, we were out there advocating a technology. We'd figured out how to, how to burn natural gas and diesel engines. We were excited about that. But this was really our first uh, uh, chance to sit down in a really broad sense with the major oil company executives, uh, with uh, the environmental organizations, uh, with economists and others, and talk ab about uh, our technology as it uh, fit into the broader system. So it was, it was exciting and, and it was a great opportunity for me and, and my team to, in a sense, educate the broader community about the progress that these technologies were making, even though uh, uh, much of this progress was being conducted at a fairly small company uh, 3,000 miles away in Vancouver, Canada, in another country. Um, so we moved on. Early in the study, it was, as I say, it was decided that we were going to need a way to integrate results. Uh, we didn't want to come, come here in two years and, and kind of announce uh, this, is our, this is the future, you know, get, get used to it. Uh, we wanted to look at a broad ra uh, range of possibilities uh, under a broad array of possible conditions and look at what they all might mean. So we set up this kind of um, analytical framework where on the right hand side here uh, we wanted to map uh, mobility de demand across a wide array of oil price futures. Uh, and then on the left hand side here, we want to do something which uh, people haven't tried to do very often, but it's, it's a good subject for, for MIT and organizations like it, is to look at technology and to map um, kind of the aggressive versus less aggressive outcomes for those technologies as they might play into engines and vehicles. So we didn't want to, even though many of us were advocates, we didn't want to just assume uh, the best outcomes for our technology. We wanted to have a, a bit of a hard-nosed look at, well, what if, what if things go really well? How much can it do? What if things don't go so well? Um, what might be the limitations and constraints? So, so we put this picture together, which then took months to figure out how to convert it to an actual analytical tool to implement something like this. But that's. That was the task of this integrating team that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to now jump, I think, into results. So I'm going to, uh, I talked a little bit about the setup. Now I want to give you kind of a, a quick uh, run through some of the high level results. And then I'm going to drill down into the natural gas uh, aspects of this thing that uh, is the main expertise that I, I brought to the study. The findings uh, were grouped into five areas, six, uh, five areas. Uh, the first one is, is, is a mouthful, but uh, fuel economy, uh, engine fuel economy, vehicle fuel economy, uh, we said can be dramatically, it's not a surprise, can be dramatically improved across the range of, of vehicles, light and heavy duty. Um, the, the next sentence is a little bit more significant. It's, it's very significant, a little bit 
uh, stronger. Internal combustion engine technology likely to be the dominant propulsion systems for decades to come. We didn't start with that, but if you look at the alternates we were looking at, uh, ICEs are the venue by which we run all the gasoline and diesel vehicles, but it's also the engine uh, technology that natural gas operates under, and it also uh, uh, supports all the biofuels that we're talking about. So it's only the electric vehicles and the fuel cells that are not ICEs of the four alternates we looked at. But it was a conclusion looking at across a wider range of cases that the ICEs were, were going to continue to be uh, the majority of the engine types in use in the transportation sector. Now, the second part of that sentence is a little more, was a little more controversial because uh, we said liquid fuel blends, petroleum and biofuels, continuing to play a significant but reduced role, okay? Doesn't sound like a huge concession, perhaps, to, to many of us and many of you, but with the oil companies, this was, this was a pretty strong statement to stand behind that petroleum would be seeing a reduced role in transportation over the time frame of the study. And I'll show you some of the results that supported that uh, as we get further. We did a massive look at technology. As I say, it was a technical uh, exercise primarily. Um, and we identified uh, a dozen specific technologies that were viewed as sort of deal breakers for different ones of these technologies we're talking about. I'll summarize that later. We looked a lot at infrastructure, uh, natural gas, uh, in the case of natural gas, uh, retail fueling stations, LNG, CNG stations, uh, in the case of electric vehicles, charging systems uh, uh, and stations, etc. Options, so, so we're saying that, uh, that this is an area where there are huge challenges for uh, acceleration of any of the alt fuels. You know, we're sitting here with a, an incumbent technology, gasoline and diesel, that's got its infrastructure in place. But to bring on anything new is going to have really large infrastructure challenges. Uh, GHC emissions, uh, we say that if, if the technology issues and infrastructure can be overcome, then these economically competitive lower carbon fuels and improvements in fuel economy are going to lead to major improvements in greenhouse gas emissions relative to, uh, relative to today. So we, we saw um, a set of results where we could get significant reductions below today's levels. Um, but we found it very difficult to get that 50% emission relative to today that Secretary Chu asked for. So we say that additional strategies, and by that we mean beyond just these fuel mix uh, possibilities, will be needed to get all the way down to a 50% reduction relative to today. I'll say a few words later about why that's so challenging. And then energy security. Um, by bringing in, you know, going from the situation where we're 99% liquid fuels today to a situation where we're less than that, you know, uh, liquid fuels are going to be somewhere south of 99%, perhaps way south. And by bringing in these new technologies and fuel systems, we, we think that's uh, providing a greater diversity for uh, U.S. energy transportation systems and thereby thereby a, a contribution to our, to the nation's energy security. So these are the, you know, this is the one page summary of the high level findings which I'm now going to break down in a few areas. Fuel economy was a huge uh, part of the study. We, uh, the, the more we looked at fuel economy possibilities, the more we found, frankly. Uh, so we had people like uh, uh, John Wall, the CTO of Cummins, uh, running uh, the heavy-duty analysis on what was possible with fuel efficiency improvements. John's an MIT grad as well, by the way. Um, we had General Motors looking, and Toyota and others looking at light-duty uh, technologies. Uh, people like Amory Lovins uh, at the Rocky Mountain Institute, who's uh, uh, a huge advocate for uh, fuel efficiency improvements, etc. Uh, everyone concluded that uh, there was a, a ton that could be done. It was all going to improve fuel efficiency and fuel economy uh, and be very helpful. Um, we also found that each of these alternate fuels, uh, there's a lot of debate about whether some of them will ever be economically competitive, but uh, the conclusion was that there were conditions under which each of them could become economically competitive by 2050, whether it's fuel cells or battery electric vehicles or natural gas systems. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, ICE technologies dominant uh, for decades. 
Uh, th this is a big uh, summary result that I've uh, put up here in the front. Uh, I'm now mapping uh, in the, for the year 2050, uh, the final year that we were asked to look at, the total fuel use uh, in transportation by these uh, different fuels. So, um, and, and we're looking at ranges here. So these yellow bars are the range of results across all, all cases that were run. And uh, the red bar uh, is today's level of uh, use. So for example, total energy use in petroleum you see on the left is at about 20 quads or a bit higher today. Um, biofuels, a fraction of that, and, and the others are close to zero. Natural gas, electricity, hydrogen, the red bar is at zero because they've just begun to penetrate markets. But you can see, uh, you can kind of see the story developing. You're seeing a story developing where an array of technologies may be coming into use in parallel in some cases. Uh, and petroleum use, while still significant, uh, is likely to be significantly less than it is today in the United <coughs> States. The, the, the highest case for petroleum had it coming in just a bit above today's levels. Um, but you can see the low case had it running down to you know, 10 to 20 percent of what we're using today. Um, biofuel and natural gas uh, were the two alternatives that um, took up most of that uh, space, you know, substituted for the most petroleum. Uh, uh, again, a, a pretty big range across cases. Electricity and hydrogen less so, uh, although their market shares uh, were more significant than you might think looking at this chart. Um, this is their fuel use, but their, their fuel efficiency is so high that their market shares would, would be uh, higher uh, than the proportions you see here. Um, I may have a chart that looks at their, fuel sh their market shares later. Uh, but, but so you can see big, big ranges across different cases, but some obvious kind of trends that pop out at you, like uh, less petroleum and a lot of biofuels and natural gas going into transportation over the next 40 years in the United States. Uh, we'll talk about why, why these results uh, as, as we go along later. I want to say a word about technology a, a bit, because this was a huge area of, of expertise, the people that were in the study, and of effort. We asked John, who chaired the technology arm of the study, to organize a dozen or so of the leading experts uh, uh, on a variety of subjects of interest to the study. And these were the folks that uh, got involved. Uh, three or four of them are from MIT, as you can see. Um, we used these guys uh, as expert uh, thinkers and reviewers of not only specific technologies, but broader scientific issues. So every six months, uh, a, a group of us that were running d different parts of the study effort would convene uh, with these folks, present what we had done, where we were at, and ask for their thoughts and suggestions. Uh, so uh, very valuable uh, exercise, engaging a lot of uh, very bright people. For example, for natural gas vehicles, I, don't, I didn't put this up here for you to read because you can't. Uh, I can't read it myself, but I put this up here to illustrate the, the level of detail we chased uh, some of these issues uh, at. So this, this is a, a, a summary graphic on potential uh, hurdles and challenges to the, in this case, the expansion of natural gas vehicles, just heavy duty natural gas vehicles. So we looked at uh, things uh, around the engine, uh, the vehicle, the economics, uh, storage and broke, listed a number of potential challenges that are in, uh, on people's minds today. Uh, we, we assessed our view of their importance. Uh, we, we graded them in terms of the, the traditional uh, green, yellow, red signs for red being a, a big challenge and green meaning uh, one that's under control. And uh, we uh, concluded and decided whether any of these were sort of deal breaker challenges. In other words, if this doesn't get solved, uh, the technology can't go anywhere versus, uh, well, it's a bit of a pacing element or it's a performance uh, issue, but you know, you can still deploy uh, and, and just recognize you've got, you've got some issues to deal with. So, so this is the kind of thing we did for natural gas and then uh, similar exercises for all of these uh, uh, different fuels. Um, we ended up identifying uh, more than 250 uh, potential significant technology challenges across the alt fuels uh, 
in total, including uh, conventional fuels. And we uh, a lot, did a lot of work with the technologists and the technology arm to filter that down into a dozen um, what we consider deal breaker uh, technology issues. So, so for example, with uh, uh, plug-in battery electric down here, increased battery energy density, increased battery longevity, and reduced degradation. We're saying that if you don't do those two things, electric vehicles aren't going to go anywhere. You know, not not that they'll be slightly constrained, but they're absolute deal breaker issues. Something has to change between now and 2050 to allow a decent future for this technology around this issue. Um, so, so that was helpful in terms of kind of articulating the technology space uh, around these different fuels. Uh, in the case of biofuel, you can see there's a lot of issues having to do with uh, um, production capacity and likely volumes that might uh, emanate, increasing biomass yield, for example, being a, a really important uh, technical challenge. So, so it was, uh, the study is rich with uh, technological detail around each of these fuels. Um, one thing I should say, I'm going to go into GHGs uh, next, but I think uh, a good time to mention that uh, one of the most important things that's come out of the study isn't just the results of the study, the findings, but this massive amount of data that's been uh, put together in one place under reasonably consistent uh, sets of premises, you know, comparing fuel cells to, to uh, natural gas vehicles, to gasoline vehicles, uh, to electric vehicles uh, in different time frames under similar economic premises, oil price uh, futures, etc. Uh, John Deutsch, uh, when we launched uh, this thing, presented the report to the Secretary Chu a month ago said, and I think he used the words, a tsunami of data has become available here. Um, the report, the final report, uh, is available on the web now. Uh, will be in printed copy by the end of the year, but probably will run uh, well in excess of a thousand pages of uh, information, data, findings, uh, challenges, etc. And uh, the other thing that's interesting is that the analytical model that was developed uh, to do all of this uh, analysis is being made available as well. It's, it's also available on the web. And I fully expect uh, energy researchers uh, throughout the US to, to um, play with it in, in cases to uh, uh, not only kind of take a look at all the data that went in, but also to think about modifying um, the model inputs to, to do their own runs. Because uh, it's, a, it's a remarkably user-friendly uh, model of economic attractiveness of competing alternatives for light duty and heavy duty uh, vehicle, fuel, uh, vehicle choice, uh, technology choice. So that was technology. Now greenhouse gases, I mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, it's, a, it's a pretty positive story, I think. We found that despite very significant increases in demand, uh, vehicle miles traveled, both for heavy duty and light duty, uh, that uh, there are technologies available and improvements in fuel economy and all fuels available that in, in total are expected to allow us to bring uh, GHG emissions from transportation, uh, keep it at today's level instead of running up with uh, the increased demand, and further, further reduce it significantly below that. But as I say, uh, we, we found it challenging to get all the way to 50%. Uh, this sort of shows you why. Uh, this is light duty. This chart is light duty transportation. Uh, the GHG emissions in 05 on the left. Uh, the next bar is what those emissions would be just tracking the, the demand growth, the, dem the growth in vehicle miles traveled over the next 40 years without any fuel economy improvements or without any new alt fuels that are lower in carbon. So you can see you've got, you got an even bigger problem on our hands to deal with. Uh, the third bar, and, and these ranges reflect ranges uh, within the so-called reference uh, oil price case, um, but the third bar shows uh, how much of that uh, uh, GHC uh, increase can be offset by fuel economy improvements in the basic engines, uh, uh, fuel efficiency gains. So, so an enormous benefit there, bringing the GHCs back down to about today's level or even a little below just with the very aggressive fuel efficiency programs that people are talking about. And then on the right side, uh, the really good news is if you then, then add the alt fuels into the mix, uh, all of which are lower carbon than petroleum, uh, natural gas, biofuels, electrics, and hydrogen, you can bring the GHCs down further. And you can see in the case of light duty, 
uh, we kind of get within that 50% reduction range relative to today. Uh, we've got a range of findings, but uh, we've got close uh, there, which we felt good about. But heavy duty is tougher. Uh, heavy duty is tougher because um, the experts don't believe that some of these low carbon alternates are really going to uh, apply to, to heavy duty vehicles. Uh, heavy duty big rigs aren't expected to be running down the highways on uh, hydrogen fuel cell. Um, power systems, or even uh, electric, uh, battery electric vehicles. Uh, so the, the analysis, uh, the heavy duty team, which was uh, chaired by Cummins, as I say, concluded that the primary alternative to diesel was gasoline, which is kind of interesting because uh, that's how they used to run heavy duty vehicles, and natural gas, you know, the, the, the Westport stuff that I've been working on for a decade or so. Um, and, and some biofuel blending with diesel. Because of that, um, you, you, get the, you, you get a bunch of help from, so this chart's a little different. Uh, instead of four segments, we only have three uh, because we've combined the, the two on the right into one. Uh, what happens, uh, for, what are the benefits of fuel economy improvements and the addition of alt fuels, which is primarily natural gas in the case of heavy duty. So again, you had an even bigger increase in expected demand, vehicle miles tra traveled, growing even, or growing faster for heavy duty markets, um, which we then had to try to offset and bring back. And we got there, we got below today's levels, uh, but we didn't get down to 50% below today's levels. And that's, that's because if your only, um, your only alt fuel is natural gas, uh, you, you're gonna get uh, perhaps a 20% uh, carbon benefit from natural gas versus diesel. 15 to 25 percent, something in that range, but you're not, it's, it's not hydrogen, it's not zero carbon, um, and it's not uh, electric vehicles running on renewables, which is zero carbon. So, so uh, heavy duty is tougher both because there are fewer alternative fuels and because the growth and demand is expected to be more significant. You put light duty, heavy duty together, we got significant GHC reductions versus today, which I think is a, a big accomplishment, but, but, prob but not quite to the 50% uh, reduction. To do that, we've said you gotta do some extra stuff, and the extra stuff uh, could be uh, a greater greening of the electricity grid in the United States relative to what's forecast uh, for that system by the uh, Department of Energy. So, so more renewables and natural gas and le less coal. Um, um, there are some other things you can do. You can, uh, you can work on demand, you know, you can find ways to get people driving fewer vehicle miles. Um, uh, actually, natural gas has, a, has an option. Renewable natural gas uh, has a tremendous uh, carbon benefit, uh, 50 to 100 percent reduction. So that's natural gas made from uh, uh, methane emissions at landfills or from ag agricultural waste or uh, gasification of uh, forestry and, and other products. So, so there are some things we can do, we think, to get to 50%, but they weren't the standard things that would get us there just by ordering more electric vehicles or more fuel cells or more natural gas vehicles. So, uh, so that was gr uh, greenhouse gases. And th these are the kind of the summary findings on greenhouse gases. I'll, uh, I think I'll leave most of this uh, for your reading uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, it's pretty much what I have said. Uh, the, kind of this thing in green, I just highlighted the medium heavy duty segment. Combination of natural gas and vehicle platform improvements provided the lowest uh, GHC emissions. Uh, we haven't ruled out the possibility that uh, so-called disruptive in innovations could change some of these conclusions. Disruptive innovations are those we don't know about. Uh, we can't really even identify in some cases what they might be, uh, but they're outside of the realm of what's expected in terms of technological progress. There could be developments uh, that could change uh, findings that are unforeseen, but uh, it's gonna take that kind of surprise uh, to improve the picture on something like this further than what we've come to. So what, what did all this uh, mean for natural gas? I mean, that's kind of where I came into the study. It's kind of an awkward thing to take on as a, as a company executive. You know, you're taking your company's interests 
and our technology, which we'd spent a lot of money developing and we were very proud of. And you're kind of putting it into this uh, political, uh, economic, uh, analytical environment with lots of other people who could care less about your technology and, and your interests. So you, you jump into this thing and you're not sure how, how the results are going to come out. Uh, you're not sure, we didn't even know at the start uh, uh, that we were going to use uh, analytical tools and economic models and energy models to analyze uh, alternatives. So, so I found myself uh, every couple of months over the two years getting asked by uh, um, my colleagues at Westport, you know, how's it looking, how's it looking, natural gas doing okay, you know, what about light duty, what about heavy duty, uh, you know. Uh, so, so it was a little bit awkward because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in the study to promote Westport's interest or even uh, really natural gas's interest, although that came pretty naturally to me, I must confess. Um, but I was there to be part of a coordinating committee doing a, a, a rigorous uh, scientific assessment of an issue that was very important for the United, for the country. So you know you're, you're wearing a couple of hats, and uh, it's uh, it's an interesting exercise to be part of in, in that regard. And it was it was quite exciting and a lot of fun uh, for me to do that. But this this these were the main insights that came out of all this, not only out of my natural gas team, uh, which was a lot easier to to bring to some of these findings than then taking to the broader group with all the other uh, alt fuels represented uh, with the oil and gas company interests. But, um, you know, what's driving all our excitement about natural gas these days is, is the resource and the, and the economic low cost nature of it, the, the uh, massive discoveries of uh, uh, shale gases in the United States and elsewhere and the very low cost that it's being produced. So first finding is the potential uh, that potential for low-cost supplies is uh, driven by the shale gas provides an economic driver for the use of uh, natural gas and transportation. Uh, we have to keep rem reminding ourselves that uh, until recently there, w there was no use of natural gas and transportation, just you know, sporadic anecdotal use and that, that's still true in a macro sense when you look at percent uh, of market share. Natural gas is used in every sector of our economy except for transportation, you know, historically. Uh, so this was a, while an obvious conclusion, it was an important conclusion that there is a potential for increased use. Um, and, and then the second one surprised people a bit too. There's an opportunity for both light duty and heavy duty natural gas vehicles. Uh, and, but it's contingent on this fuel price advantage, the fact that natural gas is so much cheaper today than gasoline and diesel. Uh, we're talking a buck fifty a gallon equivalent benefit or, or more uh, to, to natural gas versus oil at the retail outlets today. So the economic competitiveness is, is contingent on sustaining that uh, difference. Uh, the third bullet was interesting because it was kind of unique to natural gas. There are few technological barriers to deploying natural gas and transportation. A lot of the, uh, the basic research is done. Uh, companies have been working away in the science uh, for a while, kind of waiting for markets to emerge. Uh, there's not as much catch up that has to be done and the technology analysis concluded basically that there were no deal breakers in, in this technology, unlike electric vehicles, unlike uh, fuel cell vehicles. So that was very important. Uh, the fourth one we take for granted, but is uh, huge in importance, that all these improvements in internal combustion engineers that are being driven by the petroleum uh, use in ICEs are applicable to, to natural gas engines because they run the same engines. We're running the same diesel and spark ignited platforms that uh, gasoline and diesel operate on. And lastly, this infrastructure issue is, is huge. Build out of infrastructure is critical to support the expansion of natural gas that we're talking about. Uh, that's a different problem with uh, heavy duty when you, you can uh, benefit from a lot of these vehicles kind of going out and back the same day so you can refuel them at uh, their home base versus uh, passenger cars where as we know we need uh, re refueling stations every, uh, every mile along the highway. So infrastructure is a big issue but there, are, there is progress being made and uh, it'll continue to be uh, a challenging I think pacing element for how fast uh, natural gas can develop. I want to look at heavy duty uh, for a bit. I think we're doing, uh, got another 20 minutes or so, don't we? In terms of talk. Um, heavy duty, uh, when, when we're talking about natural gas, we, we 
we like to talk about first because that's where most of the action has been, that's where most of the work has been going on, most of the technology work, and most of the early market uh, development uh, is going on. Initially with buses, in fact the Boston uh, transit system has a, a bunch of uh, the buses running on Cummins Westport engines that we developed. Um, more recently the refuse uh, truck market has taken off and now for the first time ever uh, we're beginning to put some uh, larger trucks on the road that uh, move uh, cargo and goods uh, around. Uh, this chart kind of shows kind of what the starting position is. You've got this big increase in vehicle miles traveled being shown at the top under the DOE reference case. Uh, you've got the, the uh, AEO, that's, uh, that's DOE lingo, that's Annual Energy Outlook of the, of the Energy Information Administration from 2010. You can see uh, the oil use uh, from, from today out. And then carbon, carbon use uh, kind of based on those same numbers before any of the uh, analytical work was done in this study. Um, uh, we looked at different oil prices uh, on the bottom chart. Uh, the reference case uh, EIA uh, scenarios showed about a buck ten difference uh, between diesel and natural gas. Even as you go out to 2050, which uh, is quite a bit less than it is today, it's it's uh, more than it was uh, uh, when the EIA put out the, the their, their base case in 2010. And then the high oil case uh, showing a $2.40 price differential. It's this fuel spread that drives all the economics for natural gas vehicles because we, we save money on fuel, but we cost more uh, to build the engines and trucks. So it costs more to buy a truck, um, but you, you're making it back on fuel over time depending on how many miles uh, you travel. Um, went through, the, you know, there was just a massive amount, you know, massive amount of work that went on around getting data uh, together and uh, um, balanced and uh, characterized properly with appropriate ranges uh, uh, from low to high. But so, for example, in the case of natural gas trucks, class seven, eight, which are the big trucks, um, we had to develop uh, cost forecasts for, for tr uh, you know, for vehicles. Uh, out uh, for 40 years in, in terms of the incremental cost relative to, to diesel trucks. Uh, well, you know, that information is not available. Uh, there's only, frankly, one company uh, making heavy duty natural gas engines. It's uh, increasing over time. So, what data was available was private, uh, and nobody had forecasts out 40 years. So, we had to go through and create it working with. Um, the companies involved, not only create the data but make it public, create it in a public sense, which was awkward for s some of the folks, and, and then put it in a format that could be used by this analytical framework that was being developed here. So, so we did that, uh, so, so we got a pretty wide range of cost uh, uh, expectations. It varies uh, pretty dramatically depending on technology. Are you looking at a, combust a diesel engine or a spark ignited engine? You can you can run heavy duty vehicles on either. But so we put uh, we made a bunch of uh, kind of simplifying assumptions to create this range based on uh, real uh, data uh, coming in from the people in the industry about where where they thought the sh the near term cost would be uh, to avoid getting <clears throat> kind of swayed by the advocates on these different technologies on. You know, how great they thought their cost would be in 2050. <clears throat> the study imposed kind of uh, technology learning curves on all the technologies equally, I think starting in the year 2020 and going out to 2040, you know, a 1% decline annually, for example, in system costs. The, the data between now and 2020 was more based on real information coming in from the guys doing the work in the field. But so that combination of methods we thought allowed us to get a pretty balanced portrayal of cost expectations from the different uh, uh, fuels represented. Th this was in fact the precise range that we came up with for uh, heavy duty natural gas trucks in terms of incremental cost relative to diesel trucks. So today uh, that, that range depending on technologies somewhere between fifty and seventy five thousand dollars so so you can buy a diesel truck today for about a hundred thousand bucks but to get a new natural gas truck it's going to cost you hundred fifty hundred sixty hundred seventy thousand uh, so dollars it's a big increment um, and it'll, it'll take a while 
uh, to come down, uh, but we're already starting to see some, some industry fleet take up at those prices. But you can see the, uh, the premises here with, a, with the, those incremental costs are going to come down to a range of about $28,000 to $42,000. Pretty steep decline in incremental cost uh, relative to diesel. And so these are the kinds of, this information then went into the model for aggressive technology improvement premises, you know, the, the low uh, cost difference versus uh, less, less optimistic um, technology uh, improvement over time and led to some of these uh, many cases that were run. Uh, this, is, this was the result that came out for the reference oil case, which, as I said, had uh, a dollar and change uh, uh, difference uh, between natural gas and oil. You can see a diesel, which is 100% today, uh, every truck in the U.S. runs on diesel today, uh, drops down to about 60% over the time horizon under the reference case premises. The shaded areas uh, represent a range of findings around, uh, you know, different... Uh, different uh, data inputs other than that oil price. So for example, the, the range in incremental cost would drive that range. And then the natural gas uh, came up and went from zero, uh, you know, maybe it's 0.1% today or something, but went up from roughly zero to uh, about 40% over the time horizon. Pretty big substitution, a very large substitution for, for diesel, which is a fuel that's been uh, driving that heavy-duty industry for 50 years now without any competition for the most part. Um, the penetration got even more significant, somewhat more significant under the high oil case, high oil price case, as you would expect. So, so natural gas and diesel both end up uh, somewhere near 50 percent in that scenario. And, and remember, I, I said that the, you know, the experts concluded pretty early, early on that in the case of heavy duty, uh, there, weren't, there weren't any other alternatives of substance uh, to look at. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't, you don't see electric vehicles on the chart or hydrogen fuel cells on the chart. You don't even see biofuels on the chart because the biofuel guys, they feel they can produce biodiesel, but they think the uh, requirements for volumes of biofuel to supply the light duty sector are so significant that the, you know, they're basically saying, well, I can do one or the other, but I can't do both in the kinds of volumes you guys are talking about. So this was a pretty interesting set of results. I don't show the low, low oil price case, but this sector is very sensitive to the economics. Um, the low oil price actually showed uh, oil prices uh, dropping to $40 a barrel and staying there for 40 years, which uh, most of us didn't think was a very plausible case, but that was the, uh, that was the EIA's low oil price case. And in fact, you know, if oil prices are down there, I, I think you can forget about uh, natural gas trucks because we're not going to compete with $40 a barrel oil uh, with the price premiums we've got to pay back. And in fact, the modeling results showed uh, zero, essentially zero uh, heavy duty take up in that uh, case, as you would expect. But these are, you know, this would represent uh, hundreds of thousands of new uh, natural gas trucks being put on the road in the next uh, 40 years. Uh, that compares with uh, where we're at, and where we're at is the first natural gas truck was put on the road three and a half years ago uh, at the Port of Los Angeles uh, in a demonstration program that uh, we put together at uh, Westport uh, running on liquefied natural gas. So this is a brand new infants, uh, industry. There's fewer, I think fewer than 2,000 uh, class 7 and 8 trucks on the road today in the United States. So we're talking about going from there to 40, 50 percent of the annual take up. Uh, we, we pick a number, but I'm going to say we, we produce about 200,000 uh, heavy duty trucks annually in the United States. So, so this would run up to about 100,000 a year requirement from, from less than 2,000 total uh, today. So as I say, brand new technology, brand new industry. Uh, uh, you know, unpredictable exactly how this will develop over time. But what, what the study has concluded is that the economic attractiveness of this option is very high for heavy duty trucks. And that's what drove these results. Uh, this shows uh, natural gas consumption uh, over those heavy duty cases, uh, reference in high oil cases 20, uh, 2035 and 2050. Pretty significant uh, numbers in terms of natural gas use. Uh, the left is TCF per year. The U.S. currently uses something like 22 TCF per year of natural gas. So when you see uh, 
three TCF per year in the far right. That's uh, near 15 percent of total U.S. natural gas use today for heavy-duty trucks in that case. Uh, I'm going to jump over a couple of slides. You can just kind of let your eyes roam at the bottom here, and it's showing total oil use in heavy-duty trucks today versus 2050. Uh, low case, reference case, high, high case. You can see a big drop in oil use in heavy duty trucks in the reference in high cases. Um, and I realize I'm inundating you with all kinds of data today, which I, I apologize for on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, I've distilled, uh, you know, 1,500 pages of results into, into 40 slides. And, I've, and I know MIT loves data, so I decided to shower you with it. Um, and I find it pretty interesting. Uh, carbon emissions for heavy duty, same types of graphs as the last one. You see carbon flat on the left and right, slight decline, but uh, again, heavy duty, huge increase in demand, uh, offset by uh, fuel economy improvements, but uh, only natural gas as, as a carbon reducer at 20% uh, or so level. So, so in heavy duty, you struggle to bring carbon down much from today's levels. Findings, I've pretty much talked you through those as I've gone. Um, big, big, the last bullet, big reductions in oil, oil use and heavy duty possible uh, from the shift to natural gas. Uh, and huge improvements in fuel economy as I talked about at the beginning. Uh, okay, so let's switch to light duty. Um, light duty, uh, you know, as a natural gas advocate, I, I didn't have big expectations for in the study. At Westport, uh, we'd kind of put it on the back burner. Uh, the, we felt the infrastructure challenges were sufficient enough that we didn't want to start with uh, something that was going to require, you know, a national infrastructure. So we started with trucks and buses. Um, there was Europe has shown a, done a lot with light duty natural gas, but the U.S. has not previously. North America has not. But uh, sure, let's throw it in the study. Uh, uh, so we in light duty, we ran this, uh, set up this model, run all kinds of cases with all kinds of combinations of uh, fuel. You can see the alternate fuels up the top: PHEVs, plug-in uh, hybrid, uh, BEVs, battery electric vehicle, fuel cell electric vehicles, and then all these toggle switches on the right, which we used to exercise the model, flipping things on and off, high and low. You know, oil prices we've talked about, but uh, for, for the fuel cell guys, we, we ran hydrogen prices uh, high and low as well. Um, system technology prices, that was very important. That was these cost curves I was describing earlier, low reference high. Um, biofuel supply, uh, capacity, that was a capacity issue. So we'd flip all these switches and run cases. We also ran a couple of uh, kind of capital amortization uh, cases around calculating uh, annual economics, uh, whether payback of three or 17 year was required for light duty cars. So we ended up running really, you can see in the bottom right, very close to 3,000 cases uh, uh, six months ago on, on, on these light duty scenarios out to 2050. 2,988 cases to be precise. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it took an enormous amount of energy from the, uh, this integration team to go through these results, you know, and all the data that was coming out. These things are producing data on the total cost of uh, transportation, the market share, the, the fuel uh, vehicle shares, uh, the total fuel being used, oil, gas, uh, et cetera, the, the, the GHG emissions, uh, and all these segments. So uh, we had five segments uh, that we uh, detailed the light duty sector into. So just an enormous amount of data uh, to look through. Uh, an integration process that was pretty complicated. Things would be mapped at the end based on GHG and oil and costs and technology and other things. Um, pretty controversial part of the study as well because uh, many of us didn't want to get in position of having done all this work on our technologies and looking 40 years into the future. Uh, we didn't want to get ourselves in position of having a, a model that was so complex uh, you just uh, plug your data in and, and kind of pray for the results, you know, where there isn't good transparency between the data input modules and the results that come out. So there was a lot of work done to, to simplify the model, uh, to focus it on calculating economic attractiveness rather than worrying about uh, multi-dimensional consumer preference kinds of decisions. Um, 
but uh, we ended up so so it was compli it was uh, both complicated and controversial. We ended up going through a lot of reviews with the DOE. John Deutsch got uh, personally pretty involved. He was very eager to make sure this thing was transparent and uh, wasn't going to uh, confuse or um, was going to confuse people or make it difficult to understand and trace uh, results. So months of effort, but in the final analysis. Uh, this is kind of where we got to for ranges, ranges of results in light duty. Uh, this is f uh, vehicle shares now, not uh, fuel use. Ranges uh, in the year 2050 across the, all the all oil prices and all the portfolio combinations. So you can see liquid ICE range uh, 2050 uh, share about 25 to 75 percent of the market uh, in those years. So. It could be really quite low relative to today, or, or it could just be you know, somewhat lower at 75 percent. Now, mind you, that includes uh, all the uh, biofuel blends as well. So this is petroleum plus biofuel being shown there. Uh, but in no, ca no case did we see it show it anywhere near uh, today's penetration of dominance, the, the 99 percent with biofuels. And this is why uh, I argued that in the findings, uh, uh, that I agreed that internal combustion engines would remain dominant, but I, I did not agree that petroleum uh, would remain dominant. It would remain important, remains very important, but it's no longer dominant in this uh, picture, as you can see. And it may be a lot less than dominant on some of the lower bounds there. The surprise uh, to a lot of us was how strong the, uh, the natural gas uh, played in the light duty sector, uh, because it isn't, isn't doing much yet in, in North America. And as compared to electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles that came in pretty strong, as you can see. Um, I think, th think the reason uh, this emerged uh, from the cases was uh, the strong economic driver uh, that the model was uh, basing its vehicle share calculations on, uh, coupled with this strong fuel price differential, which is here today, but which we uh, postulated would remain or get stronger over time. And I think what a lot of uh, analysts today haven't had a chance to look at yet, what improvements on the cost side could do uh, to the economics of uh, natural gas vehicles uh, over time. So you go out 40 years, uh, you, you're with, uh, you've got one, one supplier in the United States today of uh, a car, uh, Honda, the Civic GX you can get in natural gas. Uh, their price increment over uh, Gas, the gasoline Civic is close to $8,000, I think. Um, that will never fly in terms of broad take up, in terms of the economic factors. But if you, if you can postulate a future of uh, technology improvement and cost improvement to go along with that, as, uh, as the technology matures on the natural gas side, as more uh, manufacturers get involved, and as the, sca the scale runs up, uh, then that, that cost increment uh, will come down. And uh, what this suggests is it's going to come down enough to provide a, a quite a potential significant market share for natural gas vehicles. Now, this assumes you can solve uh, the challenges. Uh, this assumes you can get the infrastructure out there to supply the fuels for, th for these vehicles as they come on uh, and things like that. But a uh, pretty strong finding for natural gas. It gives us a lot of, a lot of data to work with to try to understand uh, what could make uh, possible uh, natural gas as a transportation fuel more broadly than just heavy duty. Um, and the Europe experience would suggest that some of this is possible. There's a, a lot of natural gas vehicles running around Europe many of them in a, what's called a bifuel mode, which means they can run on gasoline or, or natural gas, or diesel and natural gas. Uh, these cases, I won't bore you with details, but uh, just to show you all the analysis that we went into and in getting to the finish here. This is uh, uh, oil use, um, and just kind of shows how oil use drops. Uh, uh, the top line in all these assumes that you have only liquid fuels. Uh, and then as you come down the bars, you start bringing in the alternatives like uh, uh, plug-ins and fuel cells and natural gas, et cetera. Uh, but it just sh shows you across the range of uh, scenarios um, how, how low oil might go. If you look at the left-hand side at the bottom, for example, light-duty oil use, the green bar, uh, oil use is pretty darn small uh, you know, compared to today, 10% of today, today's use. That's a case where all the, uh, all the uh, alternatives come in. You've got oil 
uh, high, not only high but higher than today. Um, and, you, and you've got access to advanced uh, biofuels as well, which take up some of the petroleum share. We did, uh, this was that cost curve on uh, natural gas incremental cost that I was, look, I was looking for earlier. Today, it's, uh, this shows that uh, uh, somewhere between seven and $9,000. The, the two charts on the left are today's incremental cost, light duty vehicles, US versus gasoline. You can see on the far right, 2050, that range comes way down uh, to 1,000 to 3,000 bucks. Uh, uh, although that purple bar uh, remains elusive, that's the storage uh, component, the, the tanks, uh, the tanks uh, on board, the light duty vehicles, uh, you know, are, are tough not to crack. But you can see the contributions from uh, uh, the engine, engine aspects, fuel handling, storage, et cetera. And this, this cost reduction curve, and similar ones were put together for batteries and for uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen. Um, but this is what makes uh, it possible to think about economically attractive light duty natural gas vehicles in the United States. Um, the colors uh, here, CNG is pr uh, sort of that purple pink, terrible colors. Uh, th th this was produced by the National Petroleum Council, not by Westport. I'd use different colors. But uh, the results are here. The pinks are the natural gas uh, market shares under all oil price scenarios. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of natural gas in these, uh, these mixes. It's the largest share of the alternatives under all oil price conditions that were looked at uh, in terms of those ranges. Uh, this shows cost of driving. Uh, just shows that cost of driving will come down with the introduction of these economically attractive uh, natural gas vehicles. It uh, shows GHG benefits. Uh, they say I'm out of time, so I'm not going to detail these charts. But I'll just finish with a, a quick uh, sort of s summary of, uh, I mentioned all this uh, technology work that went on in the study. Uh, we commissioned uh, something like 20 separate white papers on various topics uh, involved in these different fuels. Um, and, that, and that's in addition to all, all the main work that was done in the study. So 20 separate white pa papers were put together. They're done. Uh, this is the list of them. Uh, they're all available on the web. Um, uh, they're all over the map, ranging from battery technology improvements to the uh, economic potential for renewable natural gas. So with that, I will say thank you. I think I've gone an hour and five minutes. And uh, leave it uh, to Chris to decide how much time we have for questions and answers. <laughs> Thank you. That's a couple minutes fast. Maybe we could take one or two questions. In all your plots of the penetration of natural gas into the heavy duty market, it seems like the asymptote where you get a 50 50 split. Yeah. What, what's driving that? Yeah, what's that uh, uh, Bill's referring to that, uh, those two heavy duty charts that show diesel coming down, natural gas coming up, but not crossing. And uh, uh, the, the reference case didn't surprise me too much because uh, you know I wasn't expecting a massive uh, natural gas take up, so we got up to about 40 percent. But I, I was surprised when I first saw that uh, high oil price case. I mean, gosh, you got uh, I think it was two dollars and forty cents uh, price differential. What the heck's preventing the rest of that fleet from switching? And um, I think the story there is that uh, it's a, it's a chart that's sort of uh, averaging a or. A, agglomerating a bunch of results. So that was class seven and class eight. Uh, I think if it were class eight alone, you'd see, you'd see a different chart with, with you'd see the, the natural gas crossing diesel. But class seven uh, uh, got a lot of vehicles, uh, in some cases running pretty low mileage. So it's, uh, it's a bigger hurdle for the class seven, eight trucks to pay back the, uh, the price premium that we were talking about. So I think that's what's uh, preventing them from going higher in that case. But I think that could benefit from some more analysis, actually. Two quick ones, sir. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, one clarification. Uh, can you uh, tell us about your reference oil and gas prices? And so then the question is, uh, well, you mentioned in one slide that you don't really look at right. the impact of oil prices uh, when you have a large penetration of CNG vehicles. Right. But you must have some story, well, why the price stays oil if you replaced uh, all the oil transportation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I was smart enough to bring an appendix, so I have the slide you're looking for right here. The, this is the EIA oil price trajectory in the three cases. 
Uh, low oil price, as you can see, runs down to 40 bucks a barrel and stays there. High oil price, it runs up uh, just above 200 and the reference uh, runs to about 150, 160. That, that's the, those are the three oil price cases that EIA. What about gas? Well, uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't bring those charts, but the EIA had uh, uh, gas prices to go with these cases. Uh, uh, so we used the, the natural gas price range, but it was, a, it was quite a narrow range, frankly, they, uh, they're, they're ca uh, compared to this. Uh, their cases um, showed natural gas, of course, a lot lower than oil today. And, and a low to high range, a pretty modest band. So uh, in the reference and high cases, uh, natural gas always looked great compared to oil. And it was only, it was, in the low oil price case, however, um, it was a bit crazy. They actually ended up with natural gas uh, more expensive than oil uh, when you add in uh, the infrastructure cost to the, to the retail. Right, four, five, six, by 2050. Are you talking about the M MMBTU? Yeah, it uh, depends on the case. On the, the low case, it's uh, minus. Natural gas was more expensive. It was 0 0.85. Natural gas was more expensive than oil in the low case at the retail uh, location, which I don't think is a plausible future. Uh, and we didn't count, we, we focused more on the dollar per gallon uh, differential than the factor that you're looking for, but it, it would be in the seven, eight, nine range, I think. Oh the, st oh, the story, yeah, so uh, Sergey's referring to the fact that this, you know, we didn't take on uh, the challenge of developing a model of the world that would be smart enough to calculate uh, changes in the global price of oil based on demand for oil in the United States or demand for gas. Um, uh, so these were, you know, these were run with these reference, uh, reference high and low cases. We've got a huge range though, and so I think we've covered all the possibilities. But I think uh, the story on that would be that uh, the, the parallel NPC study did, did look at those things. Uh, it, it was published a year ago. It, it was focused on oil and gas resources. And it looked at uh, supply uh, cost curves for oil and gas development in the U.S. Uh, it looked at uh, the pressure on natural gas prices from increases in demand for natural gas from all sectors. They, they looked at aggressive uh, growth in transportation, power, and export of natural gas uh, to go with its traditional uses and, and did look at kind of feedback mechanisms to assess their view of the likely impacts on gas price. And they, they concluded, um, uh, it might be surprising, but given the size of the, the natural gas resource base we're seeing today, maybe not too surprising, they concluded that uh, the gas resource in the U.S. could handle the most aggressive cases for demand expansion that were considered uh, with pretty, mod pretty modest pressures on gas, gas price. So food and drink are waiting for us, so oh, I good. suggest we take other questions offline. But thank you Perfect. One more time. Thank you all for coming. Good, I can go off mic, right? <laughs>